TLO, what's popping? We are on Twitch. Uh, you can come join us if you want. Probably be done after this video, so maybe not. Just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, Gangs of London, Moscow 17 versus Zone 2. 30 minutes, so let's get into it. Grab your I'm popcorn. here on the Brandon Estate in South London, home of the drill crew. I Moscow definitely 17. don't want to hear him in talk today's about episode it. of Gangs of the World, we're going to be taking a closer look at one of the most notorious feuds in London drill history. One that started okay. in the streets, made its way to music, and ultimately ended in tragedy with multiple members losing their lives. There is another murder on the Brandon oh, Estate. TV. Three men have been stabbed in South London. One died of his injuries. It happened last night in Camberwell on the same road where 17-year-old Raheem Ainsworth Barton died from a gunshot wound last May. Two days after Raheem Barton died from gunshot wounds here in South London, his loved ones are still numb with grief. Violence only begets violence. If that's how that word fits in there. As part of this yeah. ongoing series, we've been taking a closer look at the gang culture behind some of the most popular rap music of the last decade. We've recently delved into New York's Wu oh, and Shu gangs, GD. popularized by Pop Smoke, as well as how the Black Disciples and Gangster Disciples emerged from Chicago in the 60s, which developed over the many decades that followed, ultimately spawning the modern day battles between O'Block and Tukaville, a war in the streets that made legends of its key players like King Von and FBG Duck. But today, I'm gonna take on something much more close to home. And Take a look at one of the most violent beefs in recent British drill history. A battle between two crews famous in London for both the hard-hitting music they made during this period, as well as a shocking degree of violence which unfortunately spilled out into the streets of London. With some of the incidents in this story being made even more shocking not by the fact the that guns are completely illegal in the UK. With some members of these groups being involved in brazen, broad daylight shootings in the middle of London for all of the public to see. A beef that ended up being so intrinsically linked with the music that London's Metropolitan Police were even forced to step in and censor the music of those involved. This is the story of Moscow 17 and Zone 2. Before we go any further into the video, I just want to give a big shout out to my boy A. I don't care. Ooh, Today's story takes place 17. in the south of London, with the first group hailing close to an area of South London known as Elephant and Castle. This area is known to a number of blocks, also known as estates, or what you Americans may refer to as the projects. This includes the infamous and okay. now demolished Haygate Estate, the Browning Estate, the Aylesbury Estate, which has been singled out by the police and the media extensively for gang activity over the years, and most relevant to this story, the Brandon Estate, where the majority of the members that we're going to be discussing in this video hail from. An estate which, much like Oblock, in our previous video was named the most dangerous block in America has been singled out as being the deadliest in Britain. In fact, I actually used to live just off of this estate and you might even recognize it from the background of my old Posh and Beck's music video. Now, the spot that connects many of these areas is the main strip in Elephant and Castle known as Walworth Road, a long road which runs from the center of Elephant and Castle near the underground station all the way down through Camberwell past these estates, becoming Camberwell Road, which eventually crosses with Peckham. It's crazy. Y'all got hoods that look like Chicago hoods. New York hoods and Atlanta hoods. Okay, get like all road leading the east to Peckham, an area which we will later identify as belonging to the Ops. So you're welcome for the geography lesson, but I know you're wondering how on earth this relates to gang culture. Well, the local G's in Elephant and Castle were once running together under the banner of Woolly Road or Woolly Hood, an obvious reference to the main strip of their hood being Woolworth Road. As is often the case with street gangs that have rapping members, Woolly Road or Woolly Hood was of course immortalized forever in the lyrics of rapping OGs that came from this area. These are the best verses you'll ever hear, murders. Best burners, they be heavy here. What boy and got them? No one can stop them. Woolly Hood, what's really good? What's popping? The original yeah. Woolly Road crews of the 90s. Isn't there like 280 well, gangs in London? Of the gang sets from over in Peckham, such as SN1, which, if you don't know, is actually the set that Drake's rapping buddy from his song KMT, Giggs, raps. In fact, years ago, we even oh. saw the likes of Giggs teaming up with Woolly Road rapper Buck from the OTB set in freestyle sessions that are still floating around online. But don't get it twisted, there were early beefs between Peckham and Woolly Road sets 
such as the set MOB or Mandem on Brandon, having issues with SI standing for Shoot Instant from Peckham, with there being several early incidents of violence between these two South London based groups. But again, much like we saw with the gangs of Chicago, over the years, generations of local gangsters grew old, leaving the younger, newer generation to emerge. In fact, you're going to notice a whole bunch of similarities between South London gang culture and Chicago gang culture, because as was the case with the old Chicago blocks of the 70s. I'll be the judge of that. Eventually, the government stepped in and knocked down local blocks in this area like the Haygate Estate, leaving some of the new generation of young G's displaced and looking to create new alliances both in the streets and in the booth. With new that, that solves nothing. That damn near makes it worse when you knock down a hood and you knock down a project. But then you disperse them all over the all over the local area. So now instead of all of them being in one spot, there's a bunch of them in this spot, a bunch of them in this spot, a bunch of them in this spot, creating new factions and getting bigger and bigger. So why y'all think that shit is smart is dumb as hell. The young sets popping up in the area, repping their local estates. For example, you had the AY17 set repping the Aylesbury estate. You knock down Caprini Green now, it's GD's everywhere and the burbs is everywhere. You spread them out. <laughs> and Browning 17 representing the Browning estate. And if you're wondering, the 17 is actually borrowed from one of the postcodes that is in Elephant and Castle. Now, one of the rapping older Gs from the new generation of Woolly Road was a rapper called SP17, who himself had a bit of a poppin' underground drill track in 2016 called Moscow, with the song itself being about the kind of guns that the local gangsters were able to get their hands on. Of course, with guns being completely illegal in the UK, the majority of the weapons that would end up in the hands of these Gs would be old Russian-made military weapons that were likely smuggled in from Eastern Europe. It actually kind of became a bit of a trend in UK drill around this time for people to refer to guns as Russians. In fact, this is actually why the British rapper Russ calls himself Russ, because it's actually short for Russian or Russ with oh. the Russian. Get it? Because he's, he's got a gun, he's got a Russian. At a certain point, this slang caught on. And because there were so many of these illegal Russian guns floating around these areas, particularly the Brandon estate, this led to that block being nicknamed Moscow, with the youngers from the Browning estate eventually starting their own crew in the streets and in the vocal booth being collectively known as Moscow 17. And at the end of 16, members from Moscow 17 would release breakout drill songs like the track Violence and, of course, Moscow March. These early tracks introduced us to Moscow Sala 17 Sala. members for the first time, including the likes of GB, Screw Loose, and Tizzy T. And as Moscow 17's crew of rapping drillers begun to pick up steam, we'd soon be introduced to even more talented members through new freestyles and songs, especially the likes of Incognito, aka SK, who would later be most well known for his solo tracks Blessed and Friggy, his right hand man being the non rap rapping member JB or Jet Black, and through other songs or yeah. lyrics referencing the music they would Black hang out with, we would get to know even more members like Rhino, Lisky, who actually had a big early song with Lowski from the Harlem Spartans called Mummy's Kitchen. There was Knockout Ned, Rizzy Ramps, also known as Rampage, Ted Matic, and maybe a few others who I don't necessarily need to name. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of every member or affiliate no. of Moscow 17, but it is the lineup of the people who were most actively repping the set during- I'm glad he just didn't get on here just talking Bullshit. He knows, like, he did research and period. Shit. And the people who are going to be most relevant to this. Oh, story. add in so, two seconds. Who are their ops? Don't skip mine, though, y'all. Come on now. Be, do, be, do better than me. If you follow Woolly Road South through Camberwell and then hit a left at Peckham Road, you will eventually end up at Peckham. Now, you might already be aware that Peckham was made famous by the charming antics of Rodney and Del Boy in the old show Only Fools and Horses. But you really would have to be a fool yeah, to he got a lot of info. backing in modern day Peckham, because it's this district that has one of the most long and violent histories in all of South London gang lore. As I mentioned earlier, national treasure of roadman rap Giggs is famously from Peckham and repped SN1, his set of the Peckham Boys. And when it came to gangs, the Peckham boys were serious business in the 90s and the noughties, having had a long and violent beef with nearby ops the Ghetto Boys, a beef that saw Peckham boys regularly shooting up nightclubs with automatic weapons, including one incident Damn. at the ironically named Chicago's Club in 2000 that actually left nine people- what? Wait a minute now? Damn! People injured. In fact, Giggs has even mentioned some of his our own deeper, deeper, traps in the back of Chicago's. At a certain point, the violence in Peckham got so bad, some of the locals began to refer to it as Peck Nam because people were out here dying like it was the Vietnam War. Vietnam. Not dissimilar to how or people call Chicago Chirac. In fact, while we're on the topic of similarities with Chicago, the 2000 killing of 10-year-old Damiola Taylor by two 16-year-old brothers associated with the Peckham boys is eerily similar to what happened to 11-year-old Robert Yummy Sandifer in Chicago at the hands of the Black Disciples. Ah, is it though? Taylor by two 16 
Now, I don't know what type of Demi, Demiola Taylor, was he in it like that? Your old brothers associated with the Peckham boys is eerily similar to what because happened to an 11 year old Yummy was he was 11 but he was a different type of 11 year old <laughs> in Chicago at the hands of the Black Disciples and just seeing these similarities between Peckham and Chicago right down to the impact that it's having on the innocent preteen children that are growing up in these areas I would have really to look just that drives up. home how similar the awful consequences of gang activity can be anywhere you are in the world in fact you might even be surprised to know that superstar actor John Boyega is actually from Peckham and was even a childhood personal friend of Damiola Taylor with it being reported that Boyega was actually one of the last people to see him alive. Mad. Anywho, right, we had rappers like Giggs and others emerge from out of the Peckham boys, trying to make it and get successful in music legitimately. Thing is, the bag was much more difficult to secure at this time. This was pre-streaming, but post-music piracy, which of course means that the best way to make money at the time for a rapper was to perform shows. However, shows. once London's Metropolitan okay. Police realised, they came up with a new way to finesse rappers called the Form 696, a document that promoters would have to submit to police before a concert was allowed to go ahead. But what happened is that the police ended up using these forms to target and prevent shows happening specifically from the rap and grime genres. A practice which was identified many wow. years later as having an inherent racial bias. So in the face of rappers being unable to perform, that's where we saw the absolute legend in the game, the big dog Tim West no. Westwood himself stepping in and creating his legendary Crib Session series. Providing he stepped in. <laughs> I platforms for rappers Tim be platformed by the police and inviting them to perform mini gigs excuse the pun he just saw a way to make money them in my and uploading mind. them to youtube without the interference of the police with the very first crib session ever of course being gigs sn1 session and to this day westwood is still using his crib session format to give opportunities to the greasiest drill rappers that london has to offer ironically eventually attracting the attention of the police who would go on to remove both moscow 17 and zone 2 crib sessions from youtube but more on that later so from the peckham boys spawned the younger generation, Younger Peckham Boys or YPB. And just like we've seen so far with Moscow 17 or the Chicago BDs and GDs, over the years what with police involvement, members being locked up or killed or simply displaced by housing authorities, as the years went by these subsets and younger groups also became That'd more be. fragmented and split up. But eventually out of YPB we would see several babyface rappers who would go on to become future drill legends. Particularly a 12 year old kid called Preacher who would later go by the name PS and another talented little scout oh. Okay. Case, who would later change his name to Nasty and then again to Quengface. Another oh, young okay. microphone and eventual real killer would be Didn't Dennis, later going by the name D Squeezo. And at a certain point, several of these rapping members joined up together to create a road rap crew called 365. Together, they would drop posse cuts and freestyles, showcasing their talent and also introducing us to new members. People like Shay Squeeze, Trizak or Trizla, Karma, Scully, Snoopy, Trizla. LR and Mad Max, who isn't that active now for quite sinister reasons that we can get into later. Now, this crew eventually would change their name from 365 to Zone 2 Zone and releasing two. their first official project, the No Hook Mixtape. And I just want to say, setting aside the crazy beef that we're about to get into, Zone 2's music is genuinely really, really good. And some of the most underrated UK drill that the country has to offer. Zone 2's is music it is actually very cohesive, partly because Carnes Hill, the iconic drill producer and pioneer of the sound, who famously brought Brixton-based drill crew 6-7's sound to life, would come through and produce full-length projects for Zone 2, including their 2018 tape Hillside Zoo, which in my opinion is genuinely one of the hardest drill or rap projects ever made. And some of the stuff they say on there is so devilish, I feel like I'm going to hell just listening to it. The project actually <laughs> features a blood-stained elephant on the cover art, which probably doesn't take too much interpretation. Anyway, so Zone 2 and Hit Squad, the seemingly street-focused crew of Zone 2 affiliates actually doing dirt in the streets, would of course accumulate a lot of members, not all of whom are relevant to this story. So for the record, there might be several names who you think should be included here, but I'm not going to include, because it's either not relevant to this story or I can't verify the facts that they were involved beyond social media speculation. But this is the core group of people who are at least known to have been associated with Zone 2 or released music with them over the period this story takes place. So now you know the crews and members involved, we can take a closer look at how this beef started and how it would eventually escalate into deadly warfare, ultimately claiming the lives of people from both areas.
Now, the true inciting incident in the beef between Moscow 17 and Zone 2 is kind of unclear. A lot of rumors have floated around over the years, but one thing is clear is that Zone 2 and Moscow 17 weren't always enemies. In November 2015, a remix to Meek Mill's song Rico was released by Incognito, who was then going as SK. Now, this music video was actually rumored to have featured numerous members from both Moscow and Zone 2, including Quengface and Trizak. In fact, story goes, Trizak is actually Incognito's cousin, a fact which will become all the more shocking as this story progresses. Now, now comments on the Reddit community UK Drill would suggest that things soured between these two crews after somebody from Zone 2 robbed the house of a Moscow affiliate. Initially with a Moscow member trying to get back some of those stolen items, ultimately resulting in them being stabbed. This would lead to various tit-for-tat retaliations between these two groups which would escalate each time, with two particularly shocking incidents occurring in mid-2016. One where a 15-year-old member whose identity is unclear due to them being a minor at the time, being chased through a busy funfair and stabbed numerous times in front of shocked families ultimately resulting in them being airlifted to hospital but fortunately surviving. This comes along with another incident where allegedly a Moscow member was badly stabbed eventually being found in a Camberwell McDonald's located right on the corner where Woolworth Road that becomes Camberwell Road meets Peckham Road. An incident that seems to have been referenced numerous times in Zone 2 lyrics since. And it's alleged that during these tit-for-tat skirmishes between Moscow and Zone 2 that Moscow member Tizzy T was also attacked and stabbed. An incident that was allegedly so bad that his heart briefly stopped with him at least for a a moment being legally dead. Tizzy T fortunately survived this incident and supposedly retaliated in a violent attack that quickly caught the attention of the Metropolitan Police. It's said that this prompted Tizzy T to flee the UK before the feds could catch up with him and to this day it's said he has never returned. In fact the only hint to his whereabouts seemed to be a snap that made him drop his burger. member Lowski in 2020 seemingly depicting them both together in Nigeria. Anyway despite all of the goings on in the streets the main taste that fans were getting off of this beef was on wax as these crews would go back and forth calling each other out publicly in diss records. And fans hungry for information on the beats popping off in the south of London would gobble up new songs from both sides. And sometimes things went beyond song lyrics. Zone 2 dropped their song Zone 2 Step, which was actually filmed on the Moscow 17 block, the Brandon Estate, at 7.40 p.m., a fact that was documented extensively in the music video as supposed to- At 7.40 p.m., you let these niggas shoot a video in y'all hood. Those is outside hours. That ain't supposed to happen. That's tough. There's well, proof that their ops aren't truly active on their block. Moscow, of course, dropped their famous song, Moscow March, which was one of the first UK drill songs to actually hit 1 million views. And to this day, despite having been taken down by the cops, is still a legendary song in UK drill history. Moscow also dropped tracks like City of God, which featured a high energy performance from GB, where he named numerous ops who had supposedly been injured by Moscow members by name. From here, things would continue to go back and forth on wax, with members from each side continuing to use their their songs to brazenly brag about the violent attacks that they had carried out on their ops. And all of this seemingly without a care in the world as to how incriminating this might come across. And eventually each group respectively got their own Tim Westwood crib session. Performances which once ah, again were wall to- Every time I hear Tim Westwood, my skin just crawls. This nigga like, ah my God. Wall with specific references to names and claims of attacks that have been carried out against the other side. Now, obviously, that's why I'm hoping Groundworks just continues to, to like, do what they're doing because I can't. I'd rather Groundworks than Tim. Actually, all of the name calling on both sides had everybody involved very jumpy and eager to pounce on the ops. And a lot of incidents between these crews in 2017 do remain in the streets. And I suppose to a lesser extent in the Reddit and YouTube comments. But eventually in 2017, the beef would become deadly and finally reach the newspapers when a teenage Zone 2 affiliate was killed in the middle of Peckham. Now during the height of this beef, Incognito was known for spinning blocks on his moped, looking for ops in broad daylight, even broadcasting this activity on his Snapchat, as was Jet Black and Loose Screw, as well as Zone 2 members. However, rolling around in highly populated areas of London with dangerous weapons is a very hot activity and not really advisable. So in May of 2017, yeah. JB from That's Moscow hot. 17 was apparently arrested after being caught with a samurai sword in public. Whilst he was being arrested, it is alleged that a Zone 2 Had a samurai sword? Like what was, what was he doing? 
two member oh. actually witnessed the arrest. And while it's not definitively clear exactly who that was, what we do know is that that man's younger brother was a young man named Abdi Rahman Mohammed, aka Abs. Now, Abs had allegedly been mocking Jet Black for this arrest, something which was taken as the utmost disrespect. So around three weeks after the Samurai Sword arrest, it was alleged that Incognito and Jet Black had caught Abs eating food outside of a chicken shop in Peckham on Southampton Way. And at around 11 p.m. on the I've heard of songs, but hit this mention. It was alleged that Abs was a approached by two men and stabbed in the chest with a large knife. The suspects fled the scene, leaving Abs to die outside of the Tesco in Peckham. Not long after this, both Incognito and Jet Black were charged with murder and set for a trial at the Old Bailey. This is one of Britain's oldest and most serious criminal courts, with a history dating all the way back before the 1800s. The trial started at the end of 2017, and jurors were even played music by the defendants which referenced carrying weapons. Along with images of JB being arrested with the sword, and with the defendants being identified by a friend of Abs, who was with him at the time of the murder. However, Incognito and Jet Black went with the defense so somebody that they were being was identified by Abs's friend on purpose because of an ongoing grudge. And despite CCTV evidence and witness testimony, the jury believed this. And so, after a five-week trial in January 2018, Incognito and Jet Black were both acquitted of murder. And considering how much of a oh, brazen man. attack this was, ultimately resulting in a unanimous not guilty verdict, it's no surprise that sometime after they were let out, we saw Incognito talking about the case being even more brazen on Snapchat explaining Abs' connection to the Moscow Zone 2 beef in response to people suggesting that Abs was just a civilian and not involved in the feud, even going as far to say that despite being innocent, whoever did the crime should be proud. Oh, a civilian is there for too long. Obviously, I'm innocent, like I said. But I'm just stating facts. Like, my man was relevant to the batch. He wasn't a main two. I'm innocent, like I said. But he was, like, get me. So whoever dropped him... It's guilty by association. And it wasn't me, I'm innocent, like I said. Whatever, just stop chatting shit for the scoreboard and to make, you're denying your mates. And it wasn't just these brash public statements on social media. Incognito was as bold in his lyrics as he was in his socials. For example, in his feature on Lowski's track Stevie Wonder, he seems to wear the specifics of this incident as a badge of pride, referencing dodging a 25 year sentence, incriminatingly shouting out his co-defendant Jet Black's habit of carrying and concealing a samurai sword, saying that he steps for the kill and that both him and JB tore the ock block and splashed man down, referring to stabbing. I mean, Incognito was basically <laughs> acting as if he was completely untouchable. However, eventually Moscow 17 would find themselves grieving too, as eventually it would appear that Zone 2 would catch up with their star member, committing a crime that many would think is completely unthinkable in a country where guns are totally. In today's video, I'm gonna show you guys how we color grade our studio shots in the Lumetri panel. Unthinkable. And we're gonna talk about- illegal. Y'all do better than me, don't skip my ass. We now know from media reports sometime after this incident happened that GB had already been stabbed by a rival gang member some time ago, an incident where a knife narrowly missed his heart and he was lucky to survive. And at that point, GB was only around 15, 16 years old. Consider that with the kind of troubles that JB and Incognito were going through, then it's no surprise that at a certain point, his mother in fear for his safety would send GB to Jamaica. There he would stay with his uncle in an effort to stay out of trouble and practice his rapping. And GB would spend around a year in Jamaica, but eventually he got bored, missed his friends, and made the decision to return to London to unite with his Moscow crew and try and make it as a rapper once again. So he would return to London around February 2018 and for around three months, he would get on with his life without anything happening. But that would all change on May the 5th, 2018. On this day, GB had been playing football at a pitch nearby the Brandon estate. But according to his mother and other people who were there that day, word began to spread amongst the local community Jamaica. that gang members from Peckham were driving around the area looking for ops. In fact, there had actually been reports of shots fired in Peckham the night before this, an incident which many believe was carried out by Moscow 17. Apparently three men riding on two mopeds had opened fire on an individual on a push bike, but missed. So it's entirely possible that the day after, Zone 2 members were in Moscow looking for retaliation. Eventually, it would seem that the Peckham boys caught up with GB, and in a scene that would shock many, they would open fire on him from a vehicle with a shotgun, hitting him in the chest and leaving him for dead. Damn. Members of the community frantically tried to provide medical attention to GB, but sadly it was too late and he would ultimately pass away at the scene. A 17 year old boy has died after being shot in Southwark in South London. Officers, including police, firearms and air ambulance, attended the scene. The victim was pronounced dead just before seven o'clock last night. The next of kin has been informed, as yet no arrests have been made.
After GB's killing, Moscow 17 and the local community were absolutely devastated. Locals would eventually march through Peckham singing Moscow March, and Moscow 17 would go on to release the tribute track Did You See, featuring a posthumous hook performed by GB and the song being dedicated to his memory. But it wasn't just Moscow and the local community reacting to GB's death, yeah, because after this shocking incident went down, the Metropolitan Police decided to crack down on drill videos, forcing YouTube to run around 30 everybody. music videos from various drill acts at the time, with many of these being hit songs belonging to Moscow 17, including Moscow March that had over a million views. A little while after this, the remaining members of Moscow 17 sat down for an interview with your number one journalist, Mr. Montgomery, where they touched on some of the events that had transpired up until this point, discussing both the removal of their music videos and providing a very profound perspective on whether or not UK drill music was actually contributing to the violence in the streets. A quote which went on to be misinterpreted and misused by many in the mainstream media. Starving. But okay, let's be honest here. Big man thing, like, do you think drill music Insights violence. It does influence it. You gotta put your hands up and say drill music does influence it, innit? Yeah. But knife crime and gun crime's been happening before drill music. Way before drill music. So if we wanna talk about 10 years, 20 years back, people are still getting chefed up. Yeah. You get it? And there's many ways to solve it. You could bring out youth clubs, you can bring out many other things, invest money into other things to help the community. But you don't wanna do that, you just wanna use an excuse as drill music. Drill music. It's drill music, or oh, black boy drill music. No. How about you go invest money, you go make some youth centers? What what can we turn to? Yes. There's nothing for us to turn to. Later in this interview, Incognito would go on to be strangely self-aware. When pondering how he might stay safe and change his ways, he said that his mum would tell him to change his friends. He says that's never going to happen, and ultimately, whatever happens, happens. The answer to that question, my mum will say change your friends. But that's not going to happen. So I guess we just, I don't know, whatever comes my way, comes my way, innit? Considering the way Incognito was talking in this interview, it's almost as if he knew what was going to happen next. Because within only two months of this interview being released, unfortunately, Incognito would suffer a similar tragic fate to GB, only yards away from where his friend had passed. That's tough. After Incognito was acquitted of killing Alex, he was, right, yeah. he was a major target. But strangely, the official version of this story would suggest that Incognito's wrong. downfall was a complete coincidence and nothing to do with the Zone 2 beef. Not everyone believes this and some of the details are hard to swallow. But regardless of what you think, the facts are, on August the 1st, 2018, allegedly Incognito and a couple of other Moscow youngers were hanging out on a spot near the Brandon estate selling drugs. Warren Street to be specific, the very same street where GB died, with this incident literally going on only yards away. Way. Another detail that just makes it so difficult to comprehend that these incidents are unrelated. But at a certain point, a man reportedly in his 30s had been in the area and according to police, had dialed a phone number associated with Incognito. One might assume that he'd simply been given his number and wanted to pick up whatever he was selling on the block, but we'll never know whether they had some sort of pre-existing relationship. After making the call, the man would eventually meet Incognito on Warren Street. It's at this point that Incognito was seen on CCTV grabbing the man's arm while one of his youngers took his watch and placed it in his pocket. This was the apparent robbery of the man's Cartier watch. Apparently, after the watch was taken, Incognito and his boys ran off with the man who'd been robbed taking chase. And eventually he did catch up with a struggle taking place. Knives were pulled out and three people were left at the scene suffering serious stab injuries. One of those would be oh. Incognito, with him unfortunately passing away 40 minutes after the incident as a result of shock and blood loss. You telling me the man three on one? Of his watch was ultimately responsible for the wound that ended Incognito's life, with this incident seemingly having nothing to do with the Zone 2B. And whilst that man was charged with murder initially, he was eventually acquitted of both murder and manslaughter following a two-week trial at the Old Bailey. The prosecution said that Incognito had started it, but the killer had ultimately finished it. But the jury ultimately deciding that the man was defending himself. A position that was likely largely helped by the fact that one of the younger members that was there that day was apparently carrying a large knife on behalf of Incognito. In some ways, Incognito's killer being completely acquitted of murder was incredibly poetic considering the fact that only months before, Incognito himself had also been cleared of murder yeah. at the Old Bailey in a case that seemingly had mountains of evidence against him. But Ironic. regardless of whether or not this incident had anything to do with the Zone 2 beef, the murder of two young men on exactly the same street in such a short space of time brought enormous amounts of police and media attention. From here, the Sun newspaper and other British media... I heard local police in the UK are going to start carrying guns.
media outlets begun waging war on drill music, specifically singling out the likes of Tim Westwood, smearing him for even giving these drill rappers a platform to begin with. And following these incidents and their association with drill music, the Metropolitan Police expanded their crackdown, forcing YouTube to remove even more drill videos in the years that followed. Even using behaviour orders to ban other drill sets like West London-based 1011 from making music at all without police approval. And while the Pitchless album from the slain drill rapper has become a bit of a staple in hip-hop recently, Incognito's family actually came out releasing a statement that they would not be allowing any more of his music to be released, dashing fans' hopes of hearing his long-teased Pray for Crosses mixtape. And if the loss of GB and Incognito no, they're gonna drop enough, it. Moscow 17 <laughs> members would continue to suffer in the months that followed. Jet Black from Moscow also ended up getting jail time for numerous incidents that had occurred on the streets during these deadly times, including a crazy police chase where he crashed his car and fled, leaving behind a large knife. And then, whilst he was on bail for that, allegedly a rival had spotted him out on the street in Camberwell, mounted the pavement and run him over, with with witnesses saying that once Jetback got up, he produced a large machete. These incidents would leave him jailed, as well as receiving a lifetime ban from ever entering Peckham. So from here, for a wow. significant amount of time, Moscow 17 as a cohesive group and or gang would disband- Jet Black, really about Peckham, this. And the passing or incarceration of their star members made it near impossible for the crew to pick up any meaningful momentum around this time. Meanwhile, capitalizing off of the reputations gained from seeming to come out on top in these violent feuds, Zone 2, Zone 2 and many of their affiliated members like Quengface, Trizak, Khan, or PS would release hit drill songs racking up millions of views. However, not all was good over in the Zone 2 camp because those members who were more active on the streets than in the booth would ultimately find themselves in hot water. For example, D Squeezo from Zone 2 would end up being convicted of murder and sentenced to life following a non-gang related incident over some drug money. Along with fellow Zone 2 member Mad Max allegedly fleeing the UK due to his involvement in that same deadly attack as well as it being suggested oh my by God, some that he also wanted in connection with the shooting of GB. And while from here the bloodshed in the streets between these two groups would die down. In the booth, Zone 2 members would continue to disrespect Incognito's memory as well as other Moscow members on songs in years to follow. This includes Incognito's own cousin Trizak from Zone 2, who would famously call himself Judas, regularly hopping on songs and disrespecting his very own cousin's tragic murder. In fact, oh, Zone yeah, 2 oh, oh. continued to gain clout by mercilessly kissing their deceased ops by name on numerous songs. Most notably, the 2019 release No Censor, a track made even more devilish by the fact that they played the song coin sound effect each time they mentioned a murdered op. That was the name. best part! This was singled out as probably- That was the best part. Probably the most demonic and offensive Zone 2 diss track ever released, with the track predictably quickly being removed from YouTube by the Metropolitan Police, with YouTube releasing a- They, um, they even- I have a strike on my page because of this song. Uh, Zone 2, I have a strike. And they said it's a copyright strike. No, it's not, guy. <laughs> statement saying Come that on. they are working with the Met to remove videos which are directly inciting violence. However, the thing is, the song has been re-uploaded numerous times, and ironically, the Metropolitan Police's attempts to silence this music only brought it more attention, as the removal of the track No Censor led to Zone 2 getting mainstream coverage on BBC News, with the headline, Drill Video Naming Murder Victims Banned by YouTube, only further feeding into the idea held by fans that Zone 2 are the most demonic and evil set in UK drill. In fact, it almost seemed as if Zone 2 knew this was going to happen, because they very quickly Ooh. brought out new songs which included similar but censored disses like the tracks Dead and Censored which both racked up enormous view counts off of the back of the track No Censor being removed by the police. Today, only a small selection of do it, right? that momentum. continue to make music like Screw and Maisky and even these new songs contain lyrics and disses targeting Zone 2 members and insulting their fallen brothers like Abs. I really wish I could have ended this story by saying that those involved in both sides oh, yeah, still definitely. alive managed to find some musical success and ultimately move forward beyond these beefs, making catchy drill songs that the fan love without insulting the memory of a fallen op. But sadly that's not the case and it seems like just far too much blood has been shed on both sides for these groups to ever forget the trauma that they went through during the bloody summer of 2018. That's it. Sometimes when you're working in Premiere Pro, they go commercial you have a long clip yeah, like has that. multiple different scenes in it. I don't want to see him walk around. More and more painful when you consider just how musically talented they were. In the years that have followed their tragic passing, we've seen the likes of Digger D and Heady One make it in the music industry, becoming genuinely successful mainstream music artists, getting far away from the dangerous blocks that they came from. So if there's one thing that I hope, going forward, young men from difficult areas and difficult backgrounds like this can realize that there is another way and they can make it out through music and not suffer the same tragic fate as GB and Incognito.
RIP to all of them. That's tough. Of course, there's more dangerous gangs, but the media perpetuated word of the day um, Zone 2 as the most dangerous because of all the coverage and everything that was going on. But yeah, man, TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification, man. It's very um, informal, even though he was missing a lot of information. That's what the chat's telling me. But you know, you can only put so much, man. I'm out of here.